Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Literary Lutheran Reads a Book of Concord. We have finished Article 12a on repentance, and today we start Article 12b on confession and satisfaction. Confession and satisfaction. The Roman Church transformed the great blessing of confession and absolution into a legalistic burden on the back of every Christian. In addition to requiring every sin to be confessed, Rome demanded satisfaction or meritorious works in order to make up for confessed sins. Absolution, the sweet announcement of forgiveness of sins through Christ, became tangled in the web of indulgences, satisfactions, and other human works that Rome required from her faithful. Melanchthon makes it clear that Lutherans cherish private absolution which is God's forgiveness in Christ applied personally to the believer burdened with guilt and sorrow over sin. He writes that those who despise absolution understand neither forgiveness nor the office of the keys. When death confronts a human being, he must face it with Christ alone, not with human works and satisfactions. We receive God's forgiveness freely because Christ Jesus is the victor over sin, death, and Satan. Melanchthon discusses this extensively, because the teaching pointed to Luther's evangelical breakthrough in recovering the centrality of Christ and the gospel in the church. Lutherans never denied that good works follow the gift of faith and the blessings of the gospel. But these gifts are not earned, merited, or deserved. By teaching that our participation with God's grace is what brings about eternal life, Roman theology horribly distorted and obscured the gospel, and robbed Christ of his, place, of his place as our only mediator who makes satisfaction for our sin. Good people can easily conclude that it is very important that the true doctrine be preserved about the above-mentioned parts, contrition and faith. Therefore, we have always been busier with making these topics clear and have argued nothing as yet about confession and satisfaction. We also keep confession, especially because of the absolution. Absolution is God's word, which, by divine authority, the power of the keys pronounces upon individuals. Therefore, it would be wicked to remove private absolution from the church. If anyone despises private absolution, he does not understand what the forgiveness of sins or the power of the keys is. Regarding the complete listing of offenses in confession, we have said above that we hold that it is not necessary by divine right. Some object to this, saying that a judge should investigate a case before he rules on it, which has nothing to do with this subject. The ministry of absolution is favor or grace. It is not a legal process or law. Ministers in the church have the command to forgive sin. They do not have the command to investigate secret sin. Indeed, they absolve us from those sins that we do not remember. For that reason, absolution, which is the voice of the gospel for giving sins and comforting consciences, does not require judicial examination. It is ridiculous to apply to this discussion the saying of Solomon, Know well the condition of your flocks, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 23. For Solomon says nothing about confession. He gives to the father of a family a domestic precept that he should use what is his own and refrain from what is another's. Solomon commands that the father commands the father to take good care of his own property, that he should do so in such a way that, with his mind occupied with the increase of his resources, he should not cast away the fear of God or faith or care in God's word. But our adversaries, by a powerful by a wonderful change transform scripture passages to whatever meaning they please. Here, to know, means, means to them hearing confessions, the condition, not the outward life, but the secrets of conscience, and your flocks mean people. The interpretation is truly neat and is worthy of these haters of pursuing eloquence. If anyone desires to transfer by analogy a precept from a father of a family to a pastor of a church, you should certainly interpret the condition as applying to the outward life. This comparison will be more consistent. Let us skip such matters as these. Confession is mentioned at different times in the Psalms. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Psalm 32, 5. 
Such confession of sin, which is made to God, is contrition itself. When confession is made to God, it must be made with the heart, not only with the voice, like actors on the stage. Confession is contrition in which, feeling God's anger, we confess that God is justly angry and that he cannot be reconciled by our works. Yet we seek for mercy because of God's promise. Such is the following confession. Against you, you only, have I sinned so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Psalm 51, verse 4. This means, I confess that I am a sinner and have merited eternal wrath, nor can I set my righteousness, my merits, against your wrath. So I declare that you are just when you condemn and punish us. I declare that you are clear when hypocrites judge you to be unjust in punishing them, or in condemning the well-deserving. Yes, our merits cannot satisfy your judgment, but we will be justified in this way, namely, if you justify us, if through your mercy you count us righteous. Perhaps someone may also cite James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your sins to one another. But here the reference is not to confession made to priests, but is a reconciliation of brothers to each other. Confession should be mutual. Our adversaries will condemn many well-respected teachers if they, if they will agree that in confession a listing of offenses is necessary according to divine law. We approve of confession and conclude that some exa examination is helpful, so that people may be instructed better. Yet confession must be done in such a way that consciences are not entrapped. They never will be quieted if they think that they cannot receive the forgiveness of sins unless this precise listing is made. What the adversaries have expressed in the confutation is certainly most false. A full confession is necessary for salvation. This is impossible. What traps they lay for the conscience when they require a full confession? When will a conscience be sure that the confession is complete? Church writers mention confession. However, they do not speak about this listing of secret offenses, but about the right of public repentance. The fallen or notorious sinners were not received into fellowship without fixed satisfactions. They confessed to the presbyters so that satisfactions might be prescribed to them according to the degree of their guilt. This type of confession has nothing similar to the listing about which we are arguing. This kind of confession was made not because the forgiveness of sins before God could not happen without it, but because satisfactions could not be prescribed unless the kinds of offense were first known. Different offenses had different rules. This has been the Literary Lutheran Reads the Book of Concord, and I wish you a blessed day.